Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the STN monthly webinar. This session is being recorded so that it can be offered as an on-demand CE for our members. Your lines are muted, but if you have any questions, please type them into the question queue and we'll address them at the end, time permitting. The slides from today's presentation are saved as a PDF in the handout section. STN is an accredited provider of continuing nursing education. To claim CE for this session, you must attend the entire session and complete the online evaluation of the presentation. If you are attending the session live, you will receive an email about one hour after the event with direction to complete the evaluation. CE certificates will be emailed approximately 7 to 14 days after today's event. If you are viewing this session as on-demand CE, you will be able to download your certificate after completing the quiz and evaluation. Today's speaker is Dr. David Mooney. David Mooney is an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School and the director of the Trauma Center at Children's Hospital Boston. He obtained his medical degree from St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, and completed a general surgical residency at the University of Vermont, which was interrupted by a fellowship in burn immunology. He completed a pediatric surgery fellowship at the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and returned to New England to be the director of the pediatric trauma program at the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth. He's an associate professor of pediatrics and surgery at Dartmouth Medical School. He was the chair of the Committee on Trauma of the New Hampshire chapter of the American College of Surgeons. He is the past chair of the Trauma Committee of the American Pediatric Surgical Association and the pediatric representative on the Verification Review Committee of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and is the founding president of the Pediatric Trauma Society. Dr. Mooney is a fellow of the Injury and Violence Prevention, Epidemiology, and Surgical Sections of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Surgeons, and is a member of the American Pediatric Surgical Association, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the New England Surgical Society, and the Boston Surgical Society. He has served in several consultative and leadership positions for a variety of organizations, including the American College of Emergency Physicians, the Maternal Child Health Bureau's Emergical Medical Services for the Children, and the New Hampshire Medical Control Board and the Massachusetts State Trauma Committee. He has conducted over 100 reviews of the Pediatric Trauma Centers in the United States and was instrumental in the development of the pediatric trauma care systems in New Hampshire, New Mexico, and Tus Tuscany, Italy. He is a reviewer for 13 medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, JMA Pediatrics, Lancet Global Health, and the Journal of Trauma. He has published over 85 peer-reviewed articles and 12 book chapters and is a trauma section editor of the new textbook on disaster surgery in Austro environments. He has had continuous research fundings for the past 12 years and has active clinical research projects directed toward improving pediatric injury care. He is a member of the National Disaster Medical Team and has made several trips to Haiti to both provide direct care and educate local physicians in pediatric surgical care. Please welcome Dr. David Mooney. Well, thank you, and uh, th thank you for uh, having me give this talk. It's, uh, it's a rather new thing doing this. Uh, I'm used to walking around and uh, telling all that jokes, but uh, I guess I'll just swivel in my chair. Um, so let's... Uh, so for those who are following this on, as uh, looking at the looking through the PDF, um, I changed. I've been changing it as the moments go by. So there are some uh, slides that will be different, and this is the first one. So uh, the learning objectives are as listed: societal performance of PD injury, the philosophies that guide uh, PD trauma resuscitation, and uh, identifying post-traumatic stress disorder in children as a problem. And a couple STN required slides: uh, the faculty disclosure. Uh, so I don't really have any conflicts of interest with this educational activity, um, and uh, I perpetually wish there was money and lots of potential corruption in the world of pediatric injury, but there's really no money in it, and um, so I haven't really had any opportunities to become corrupted. Uh, I do need to say, though, I do have one conflict of interest. My wife is a nurse practitioner, and uh, then secondly, that the... Um, I am going to discuss one unapproved investigative use of a commercial product in my presentation. I'm the, the IND holder, for anybody who hangs out with people who talk like the FDA people, about one product that uh, is going to be on one slide. And I'll, I will disclose that right before so you can turn off your uh, webinar if that uh, offends you. And in this statement, um, something about getting CEUs and... Um, uh, the enduring materials will expire, I presume that's January 31st next year. Um, and then successful completion, I believe you have to fill out a uh, post-test evaluation with some very difficult questions in it. 
Well, if you think this political season has been kind of crazy, wait until next time. Kanye West actually said that he is running for president in 2020. And um, now that Donald Trump appears to have locked up the Republican um, nomination for president, uh, we'll see uh, what happens the rest of the fall. Um, I grew up in Missouri, where I was um, a fairly conservative family. Um, I've moved to uh, true blue liberal Massachusetts, where something dreadful has happened to me. I've become a tree-hugging liberal. And uh, if I make any uh, clearly biased, uh, opinionated comments during this lecture, um, the, the bias is all on my part. It has, uh, does not reflect at all on the or represent the views of the Society of Trauma Nurses, if that sounds legal enough. Uh, it's, it's my own inherent bias coming out. So the flow of the talk today. So first up is numbers. Just uh, talk about the importance of pediatric injury. For many people, it will be singing to the choir, but I just can't help myself. We'll have to talk about that. Uh, philosophy of pediatric resuscitation, and really something that's been honed over uh, more than a thousand PD trauma resuscitations. I, I go to the ER every chance I can for a, a resus, and I've been doing this. In, I've been attending now. This is the end of my 23rd year. Um, it's, so, it's certainly more than a thousand. Those are just like the exciting ones. But the um, uh, but again, this seems like a nice round number. But just some of the things that I've I've gleaned from from my experience, and then um, with Maria McMahon, our program manager here, we've been able to tune our program. Um, in many ways, uh, in response to a lot of the ACS visits I've done, uh, and uh, I have to throw out kudos to Kathy Haley from Nationwide Children's, uh, many things that I've sort of borrowed and or blatantly stolen from Kathy's place uh, to, uh, to bring back home. And it's always enjoyable when I go on a trip and I see uh, some way that someone has handled an issue that we all face in a very novel way. Um, that's the easy part. The hardest part is getting it through all the committees to have it happen uh, where you live. So talking about injury in general for children. So pediatric injury, uh, does a mouse work? Yay. So pediatric injury, you see these big blue boxes. So uh, again, this is, a, this is not a new knowledge. It's 2009, but it could be any year. And all of these are unintentional injury from 1 to 4 up to 35 to 44. So in the United States, and this could be 2014, 1970, uh, any year, uh, unintentional injuries cause more deaths in children than all of the and young adults. Than, um, and if you add up the homicides and suicides, it becomes then all of the causes combined. Very sadly for me, um, so in 2009, suicide, third leading cause of death for children from 10 to 14. And I, I just can't imagine how sad and tragic that is that someone 10 to 14 years of age you know, takes their life. That's just a, a really national catastrophe for us. Well, things have been improving. Here's from 1980 all the way up to around 2010. And uh, the driver for numbers in the world of pediatric injury has always been adolescents in a car. Um, and this is 15 to 19 year olds in a car. And in our hospital, we'll go to 21. A lot of people go to 18. That age varies around the country, depending on how many pediatric surgeons or other resources you have. The more people you have, the higher that age goes. The fewer resources, the younger people draw that line. But if you can see, overall crash rate, I said males, let's try overall. Crash rate, say 40 per 100,000 of motor vehicle deaths in 1980, down to 13 now. With the most striking result, here's these boys from over 62 down to 17. So that is almost down to one-fourth of what it was. Uh, between one-third and one-fourth just 30 years ago, a dramatic decrease in the death rates in, in uh, teenagers and cars in the United States. And when, if you look at here, here so here's from uh, so the very dramatic escalation in, uh, this is the number of teenagers that are basically uh, murdered someone. And many people don't remember now, through the 80s into the early 90s, there was this dramatic increase in juvenile, um, basically murderers, um, homicide, um, people who committed homicides, and Bill Clinton passed his crime bill in 1994, and since that crime bill passed right here, this dramatic decrease, uh, I'm sure multiple people's civil rights were violated, but along the way, the, the crime spike went away. Uh, this is crack cocaine on the streets, 9 millimeter handguns were allowed in people's pockets, uh, and it was just a terrible uh, time. Uh, it was a great time to train in trauma, but uh, for society it was very difficult. But the murder rates for juveniles, at least, the uh, juvenile murderer rates, are down to the levels really back to the 60s and early 70s. This big epidemic is gone now. 
But when you look around the world, these same sort of improvements in death rates for children, this is an article, a little graphic from the New York Times, all these different parts of the world, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, the world overall, the death rates for children under five have dropped like a stone over the last 50 years. In many parts, it's, it's a sort of sad, but in the sub-Saharan Africa, it used to be more than one in four children died before they reached their fifth birthday. It's now down to around one in six, which is equally tragic, but it's uh, it's getting better. And every time this is a, the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Health Action Initiative, you know, when Hillary takes a lot of money from Wall Street giving talks, uh, she actually gives it to this group. They do things like fend off diarrheal deaths, pneumonia deaths, other neonatal causes of death, because those have really have been the drivers for death around the planet. And if you look at this graphic, which just look at the arrows, ignore a lot of the other stuff, these things that are dropping like a stone are all these causes of infant mortality. If you look at from 2004 to 2030, the causes of death around the world. And the thing that's rising around the world, road traffic injuries, they call them accidents, sadly, unfortunately the World Health does, will by 2030 be the fifth leading cause of death for everyone in the world, uh, will be the leading cause of death for children in the world. And uh, so car crashes, when more people get cars and all these other pediatric conditions fade, car crashes are rising to the fore as uh, the leading cause of death for children on our planet. Well, this trend in decreased injury rates for kids is translated in decreased admission rates. And if you look across New England for the, right through the 90s into the 2000s, and that's continued to today, fewer than one-third as many kids get admitted to a hospital now as used to. So well, every hospital used to admit kids to the hospital. It was just a part of what everybody did. You need kid would come in, you tuck them in floor, you know, to the floor, keep an eye on them overnight, and you know, send them home in the morning with maybe a cast on their arm. Um, now those kids are getting treated and released from the emergency departments because the number of kids coming into the EDs hasn't budged. It's just the number that are getting admitted. And uh, the quality and, and range of care provided in emergency departments has dramatically increased over what it was even back in 1990. But the, um, so many more of these children are they're coming in and getting released, and admission numbers are down all over. And our state, over a, the state of Massachusetts, over the last 10 years, the pediatric uh, admission volume is down by over 30% during that one 10-year period. Well, and there's this other thing. There's this beast in the system now. The American College of Surgeons uh, goes around and uh, sets up trauma centers and trauma systems and does a, a different a variety of different things designed to make sure the patient gets the best care in the most appropriate location. Well, this monster has been developed uh, in the background, which is threatening to throw a monkey wrench in a lot of the College of Surgeons' works. This is different than trauma system development. This is based on health networks and, uh, and basically business models of healthcare where um, oftentimes community hospital providers Monday morning are being asked, why did you send that patient to, you know, away to the trauma center? Couldn't we have taken care of that patient here at our community hospital? And whether it's blatant or whether it's subtle, they're, uh, they're feeling a lot of pressure to have this forced retention of patients that they don't entirely feel comfortable caring for. And it's all based on money, and in children is actually based on the fact that pediatric trauma care is actually profitable. Um, it's very different than adult trauma care. Most hospitals that provide any significant volume of pediatric trauma care actually make a fair bit of money on it. It's a positive cash flow enterprise. Well, despite the numbers being down, luckily for someone who has a career in pediatric trauma, there's still people that believe that having their young daughter on an ATV at an early age is, is wise behavior. And uh, there will certainly continue to be injured uh, children coming in that uh, need our, our care. Well, let's talk about resuscitation now. And um, if this is looks like your trauma resuscitation room when a critically injured child comes in, uh, or a critically injured adult, if you're in a mixed uh, center, um, you're not alone. Uh, this is kind of what our ER looked like uh, back in the day. And um, that's what it looked like on the day that this young man came in. Um, in the anterior part of this kid's neck, you can see this scabby thing. This is actually a bullet hole. And the bullet went in the front of his neck and went out the back of his left shoulder. Uh, we don't have a lot of gun violence in Boston. It's very unusual in children. Um, partly because we have very strict gun uh, control laws here, and uh, again, our gun violence rate is a fraction of uh, many states in the U.S. Um, so when this young man came in with this fresh from the scene with a bullet hole through his neck, uh, as you can imagine, we all freaked out and uh, ran around the emergency department like uh, chickens with their heads off, and uh, the child did fine, incredibly, nothing 
meaningful as hurt, which I still have trouble understanding. But uh, we were all traumatized by how poorly we performed at that time. So our trauma management committee decided we were going to dismantle our resuscitation and reconstruct it piece by piece with what we could identify as being uh, proven necessary and beneficial to the patient. So talking about critical pediatric trauma, um, you know, anyone who works in a hospital, there are these things that come along that uh, plague you. And they're high acuity, so something really bad may be happening or may happen, low frequency events. So you might see it every few months, every couple of years, once or twice in your career, these really horrible things that something really bad is happening or could happen and you just don't see it. Uh, the arrival of a critically injured child to a hospital is, a, is very unusual in most facilities and is a perfect high acuity, low frequency event. Everyone is nervous. I go to the emergency department, I've been down there you know, for every trauma that I can and I've been down there now, like I said, over a thousand times. Every time I go down, even today, I get nervous. Everybody's nervous. Uh, one other thing that plagues us is everyone and their cousin wants to come help. I mean, you have people who don't have any idea what to do, but they just want to come help because it's an injured kid and they got to be able to do something to help, and it helps them to be able to help. So a lot of people losing focus of the situation and facts go by. So as we started to reconstruct our system, we jumped both feet into um, the, let me go to this, this thing called crisis resource management. Crisis resource management is when Sully put the plane into the Hudson after both uh, the engines went out, knocked out by birds. Uh, I think we take off from Jersey or New York, I don't recall, but he knew how to put that plane in the Hudson uh, because he drilled and drilled and drilled on it. And even more importantly, he drilled on how to behave when all you really want to do is pee your pants. How do you function? How do you keep moving? How do you do those things that you know you need to do even though you're petrified? Because I'm sure he was petrified. Um, and so what we did then is we looked at that and decided that's how we would run our resuscitations. We have clearly defined roles. We clearly limit the number of people allowed in our room. We don't have a leader anymore. We don't have a John Wayne. We found that's too big of a burden for one person to bear the whole responsibility. So it's a shared resuscitation where every person in the room is equally responsible for the resuscitation. And I'll go over that in a moment. And we have twin event managers, the surgeon and an ER doc stand side by side at the foot. And possibly more importantly, we have limited and direct communication. There's none of the calling out, you know, we need an IV, and it floats off into the air. Um, it's an IV to a person. The person responds that they got the request and you move on. And um, let me go back to this philosophy of resuscitation, because this is something that's true up in our state, and I think it's something probably true across the nation, even though I understand that injury rates are higher in some other locations. So across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I think this was about three years ago, there were 32,000 around um, injured children brought into an ER uh, for care for their injury. There were 16 kids in our state that died after arrival to an ER. From, a, from an injury. The, the vast majority of them had a traumatic brain injury as the etiology of their death. Hemorrhagic shock is rare in a child who makes it to the ER. It does happen. It's very unusual. Um, and the, um, again, it's, uh, and there's little reason to treat all children that come into an emergency department as if they're in shock or as if they're about to go in shock. Um, I understand for the unfortunate people that take care of adults that so that's an issue much more for you. But, um, but again, it's, if you consider that one out of every 2,000 kids who arrived in an ER in our state for the care of an injury um, actually died, and then most of them were brain injuries that you could tell in advance were going to happen, um, again, there's little reason to treat kids like that. Uh, and then also the uh, thing called the grandma sign. So I love the grandma sign. The grandma always knows that the kid is sick or not sick. And this is something that we sort of push ourselves to not pay attention to, but I think that's a mistake. And what I mean by that is if, if you see the child is sitting up, looking around, interacting with the EMS, kind of thinks the monitors are cool, that child is probably not on the edge of shock or going into shock. That kid is probably fine. Um, if, however, the kid is modeled, they're flat, you know, they're, not in, they're obtunded, they're not interacting with anything, well, that kid's in trouble. And uh, again, uh, using those to help direct the severity of your intervention, it can be very helpful. Well, back to the crisis resource management stuff. So there's five principles. So first up is role clarity. Before the patient arrives, if you have a chance, who's doing what? Uh, Bill Belichick, coach of our 
uh, once again ripped off Patriots, uh, says do your job. Very simple, just do your job. And um, so what's your job? Do your job. Uh, leadership. And leadership doesn't mean being bossy. Leadership means meaning uh, allowing all of these people to do their job through uh, the proper tone in the room, and that's, you know, asking them to help you if you, you know, they see something that you've missed. It's being a true leader, not being, again, not being a John Wayne. Um, communications, closed loop communications, communications with the right tone, directed communications, you know, return receipt. Uh, communications are very important and quiet. Our common associations are very quiet. All communications get directed back to the event manager. There are no sidebars. Our documenter stands right next to the, next to the event manager. They can hear everything that's going on. There's always one person with five chores and three people with none, so personnel support is key. Um, what do you need? Do we need CT? Do we need neuro? Do we need fluid? Do we need a uh, fast machine? What, what do we have that we need? Uh, who's getting it and you know, where is it? And then the key here, global assessment. So when I was teaching my kids to drive, I, did, I didn't have them look at the hood. I had them look down the road. So it's just constantly, how are we doing? How are we doing? What's next? You know, are we going to need CT? Are we going to, is this patient going to get transferred? Are they going to stay? Do we need the ICU? Are we going to the OR? You know, what's the next thing in the flow of events? We're lucky with these two event managers because one of them's got a 30,000 foot view, the other's got a 45. So they can keep tabs on how things are going. So general behavior, everybody signs in. If we can, we meet. Names are great. I'm horrible with names, but um, try to give names. We have stickers that we put on, um, and if people write their names on a sticker, that's lovely. Um, defining the roles and contingency plans. Trauma care is not rocket science. There are only a few things that could happen. Tension in the thorax, tamponade, uh, spinal cord injury, you know, bleeding from somewhere, you know, losing the airway. There are only maybe 10 to 15 different you know, bad things that could happen. And if you plan for those and you have some sort of, okay, if this, we do these one, two, three things, and that's our stuff. And you can talk about that in advance. Patients coming in, they, you know, pedestrian hit in the chest by a car. Okay, well, we need to be ready for chest tube. We need to make sure x-rays here for a film. You know, those sort of things. Have that sort of stuff available so that if you do need it, People understand, you know, that that was one of the contingencies on the list, and it makes it a lot easier to do it. So everybody that's under gown gloves, mask, and lead. So everyone looks yellow with the mask on their face. And in our big institution, um, it's not uncommon with our 60 or 70 ER docs and 25 surgeons that no one knows each other. So we put stickers on the front. Um, I like blue, so the surgery attending is blue. ED is green and the different, so the attendings and the fellows are different shade, so you can tell who people are. And there's, we have 12 stickers per resus in each, uh, you come in the room, you get your sticker, and the rule is if you don't have a sticker, you can't come in the room. Uh, and after the stickers are gone, then, you know, you're, you're done. You can hang in the hall and we'll call you if we need you. You can gawk, you know, from the back side, but we don't want you there in the way of trying to take care of the patient. So our general strategy, I've mentioned a couple times, we have our two attendings, and it's almost ATLS. ATLS is designed for a, a surgeon alone in a community hospital with maybe a nurse and respiratory therapist and trying to sort of get it done. And uh, there's this really funny old uh, video uh, of a surgeon running some poor nurse around in circles. And within about 90 seconds, so the patient had an IV, a chest tube intubated, and a Foley, and uh, who knows, five other things were done to them. But the guy was a jerk, and he was yelling and screaming and just, being uh, bossy, and you figure that went really well, but they'll never work together again because he was such an idiot about it. Um, but so again, we, we don't exactly do that. We do a different version. A very quiet, closed-loop communication we talked about. We use very few NG tubes, uh, very few Foley's, and uh, we've been really moving away from doing rectal exams unless there's some indication of pelvic trauma. Um, NG's are for someone who's just vomiting and vomiting or somebody who's intubated. Uh, Foley's are only for somebody who's either in shock or on the edge of shock. Uh, uh, or uh, and again, we really need to monitor their uh, urine output closely. Um, we're very fortunate to have a trauma nurse leader program uh, that Maria started up. We've got a cadre of nurses in our ER who um, have trained up into things like ATCN and are um, our trauma experts in the emergency department. And one thing that's been key for us, we always have the parents in the room. Um, the parents. Uh, help the kid, the kid helps the parent, and the parent helps us. Um, no one's willing to yell and scream and carry on if the mom is sitting right next to them. Um, it just calms everything in the room down. And then we instituted this thing called a trauma checkpoint. So the idea is you're in this, this crisis situation, 
it's a really badly hurt kid. Everyone's nervous, and there's all this information flying around. And you know they need IVs, and they need an airway, and their leg is broken, and you're worried about their spleen, and their head's you know uh, marginal. And the idea is after the primary secondary survey, it's a forced pause. It's a short pause, but it's a forced pause. Okay, uh, the the event manager or the designee, if they want to choose to hand off in our teaching session, sometimes it's the resident or one of the ED fellows, they will say, you know, okay. What do we have? A five-year-old boy hit by a car on his bike. You know, he comes in with a you know head injury, broken uh, femur, and uh, belly's tender. Uh, vitals are this. You know, vitals are stable, a little mild tachycardia, um, and uh, we're we uh, we're gonna get a CT of his head, and we're gonna have to scan his belly, um, and check a, and our labs are gonna be this, and we're gonna do this for fluid, uh, and he's probably gonna have to head up to the ICU from the scanner. You know, any questions, anything we're missing, anybody, please fill us in. But you go, uh, force pause, everyone sort of takes a breath while you're sort of doing this, and then it takes maybe 60 seconds, maybe at the most if you're really detailed about it, 90 seconds. You know, we don't need respiratory, you know, people that can go away or other people that are needed like neuro, ortho, et cetera. Down the body quickly, what consoles are tests needed? Are they coming into the unit? Are they going, getting transferred? If they're getting transferred, plan for that then. So start mobilizing having or having someone mobilize the transport system so that patient can move while you're completing your evaluation. And then again, anybody else like respiratory that can go. We found that exceptionally valuable for controlling the chaos, giving everyone in the room a pseudo semblance of control and it really helps out with the ongoing care. Everybody's got the plan, everybody's chipped in their opinion, and then you move. Well, let's talk about some kids specific. So shock in children. So the, the old, you know, two liters of saline or two liters of ringers in an adult comes from children. It's 20 per kilo, um, and either saline or ringers. And anybody who is in shock, on the edge of shock, could potentially go into shock. If needed, you repeat it again. And um, the idea is that uh, um, an average child has about 80 cc's per kilo of blood volume. If you just bolus them right in, not over an hour, but right in, 20 per kilo, you've given them back 25% of their blood volume right into their intravascular space. Um, if, the, um, if that doesn't perk them up and make their heart rate come down or improve their mentation or whatever it is that you uh, was going on that you decided to do that, repeat it. Um, if, if they don't respond to a 40 per kilo prompt bolus of IV fluid, there's something bad going on. So either it's neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, um, something's in two pieces and they're bleeding to death um, because you've now given them very quickly half their blood volume back in fluid just right away. And, um, and again, if they're not a responder to that, you need to do something, intervene or, or identify the source of shock really very quickly. So we get about 12,000 injured kids up here in our emergency department. Each year, about two to four of them around there get a blood transfusion. It's so low that it's not worth for us having a cooler in our ED. If you have a higher transfusion rate or if you're attached to an adult center, then you're, you're going to probably have blood more available. We send a runner to the lab. Uh, and we have the same, you know, uh, Paxil to FFP ratio, mass transfusion protocol, um, as, as any hospital is required to now. Uh, but it's very rare. We probably activate it for a trauma patient every, well, at least every three, four years for a trauma patient, and it's usually while they're up in the unit, not while they're down in the ED. Um, TXA, data, TXA data is very tempting for adults. Uh, they're working on data for kids. It's still a little lacking for us to have started yet, but places are rolling it out. One difference for us with kids versus adults is this resuscitate out of shock. So the idea is if we get a kid who's a little shocky, we will try to resuscitate them out of shock rather than say, okay, shocky equals operating room. And uh, that's helped us a lot with our non-operative management of solid organ injuries because most kids resuscitate out of their shock. And um, we will even use pressors. Yes, we will use pressors. Uh, that was not my wife thought that was a typo, but pressors, yes, pressors is needed. And um, uh, to help with their uh, maintaining perfusion, uh, their brain and their vital organs while we're uh, putting the fluid to them. Um, we go fluid first, uh, but then again, if, if the pressors are they're deranged enough where they need pressors, we do use them. And this is a cool new measure, uh, Dennis Bensar's group. Uh, it was a different first author, but Dennis was really the one doing this, doing the behind the work. So this is um, it's called the Shock Index Pediatric Adjusted. SIP is kind of an annoying mnemonic, but it's a pretty handy measure. So it's basically just the maximum heart rate and the minimum blood pressure per age. And it's modified from the adult shock index. 
And these are just what Dennis's group has come up with for if you take the maximum heart rate for a four-year-old and the minimum BP for a four-year-old, you get this 1.2. So the idea is if your heart rate is higher, if your heart rate is going up and your blood pressure is going down, you're going to hit some limit where, like for a 6- or 12-year-old, they overlap. So you've got a heart rate of 100 and a minimum BP of 100, uh, then your SIPA is 1. So for a 6- or 12-year-old, they're in trouble. But that might actually be okay for a 4-year-old. Um, and again, as you get older, you start to approach more adult levels. So the higher the SIPA, the higher trouble. And in their study, it correlated with a higher ISS, a higher need for blood, and a higher death rate. Um, and Dennis, um, so Steve Moulton, who's down the road from Dennis in Denver, has this really cool little gadget called a compensatory reserve index measure. And this little gizmo, what it does, it just attaches to the SAT probe, and it uses the tracings of the SAT, of the SAT probe tracing to determine the patient's compensatory reserve. And, and Steve, in his wisdom, has turned it into a color. So if you're green, you're good, yellow's on the edge, red's a problem. And uh, so if you see your, if your patient's sort of heading into the red area, then their compensatory, their uh, cardiovascular compensatory reserve is basically going away, and they're on the edge of collapse. And that's a very uh, handy. It's um, I don't know when this is going to hit the market. I have no connection to it, but it's a. Uh, oh, I guess I should probably just close that. I have no idea even who makes it. But anyway, the um, uh, I've seen this discussed a couple of meetings, and it looks like it could be very helpful for us trying to determine uh, which kids need more aggressive resuscitation. This is a study from Rich Falcone and the group, uh, the multiple groups in Ohio who've actually banded together to do some nice PD trauma studies. Um, and this is actually what Rich uh, authored this paper on showing that if you have uh, a lot of activation criteria, as your activation criteria increase, your number of under triage patients will decrease, but your number of over triage, because the more criteria you include in your activation criteria, the more times you activate, which kind of makes sense. Um, and you can sort of pick and choose where you, how many criteria you have, and they kind of thought somewhere around here was a sweet spot, but it depends on your tolerance for uh, over triage or your lack of tolerance for under triage, how many criteria you should have. And at our shop, we've identified that our brain injuries were a big deal for us. And so all trauma centers now require that these American College of Surgeons six criteria for their highest level activations, and they're in the, the, the new book. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember which color it is off the top of my head, but the new ACS book. Uh, but we've implemented these three things, these neurostats. So it's our normal stat is the name of our highest level activation. For patients, Jesus less than eight from the scene or has any shift um, on, their, on their outside hospital brain CT from a transfer, then our neurosurgery attending gets a phone call because they, they, they have told us that that's a patient that they want to be involved with, and we're all going to have to have these timed criteria for when neurosurge gets involved, and this is one of ours. Our mid-levels, uh, a subdural and epidural, that's a little big but no shift, and our lowest level, uh, and this also gets the attendings call, uh, the neurosurgery attending, um, and the subdurals that are a little bit smaller is a con the resident gets, neurosurgery resident gets called, that patient's coming. Um, and we've demoted our mechanisms uh, to just really activating our lowest level, our consult or evaluation level. We don't include mechanisms anymore in our highest two levels of activation because we found them not very helpful, and there are a reasonable number of papers that would uh, agree with that. Um, but the key thing here is to fit your responders to your facility. So our pediatric brain surgery attending responds to our neurostats. Well, if you don't have a pediatric brain surgery attending that's, you know, within 100 miles of you, that's probably not going to be very useful for you. But the question is, if you have these kids who come in, who's going to respond? And who's going to respond that's going to be able to appropriately care for that child uh, that you're going to see, you know, a handful of times? And this is a kid with a lap belt injury. A very common injury among children is by poor product design for cars. We see them all the time, and I'm sure you know, all the other children's hospitals do too. Um, and again, it's a, a great example of poor product design uh, that affects the, the health and well-being of children. So let's talk about how just uh, going on with the, sort of the general evaluating an injured child. So in adults, it's become a CAB. Well, in kids, it's still ABC. If anything, it's actually AAABC, the airway, 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 so important in an injured child. More children die, more injured children die from la lack of an airway or losing their airway than die from cancer every year in our country. So if you could choose something you wanted to do during your life to improve the, the welfare of children, you would do more good somehow securing and maintaining every airway in an injured child than you would by curing childhood cancer. It's that important of an issue. Uh, and this uh, disability exposure, and it sort of tails off down the alphabet. 
So the general philosophy of airway management in a child. So what's the point? I mean, why do we do this airway stuff? Well, the idea is that you want to oxygenate and ventilate the child. So it's not to get a tube in. The tube is one means to the end, but the end, the goal is the oxygenation and ventilation. And the reason why that's important, if you're oxygenating and ventilating, ventilating the patient, you've got them. You're, you're at your target. So now what you can do is you can check your own pulse and make sure, okay, we're all good here, and then get your equipment, get your help, make sure the right person is doing it, because it, it's a poor time to learn uh, intubation uh, in the trauma room in a patient that needs to be uh, immediately intubated, it's a really poor time for a trainee to learn how to intubate. They'd be doing a little bit better off doing that medical patients or maybe in the operating room doing some elective, you know, hernia repair intubations. Um, but again, so if you're oxygenating, ventilating them, pause, make sure you've got the equipment, make sure you've got the staff, make sure, you know, the best person is going to be doing the, intu the intubation, etc., and then do the intubation. Now, most kids are fine. Luckily, they don't need to be intubated. They don't need any airway. They're fine. Um, bag valve mask is very effective, and in fact, for pre-hospital, uh, Marianne Gauchy's work from LA County shows that bag valve mask uh, and an oral, an oral airway as tolerated pre-hospital is actually, uh, in their study, not statistically different, but it was at least as good as intubation for airway management pre-hospital. And uh, that's been confirmed in uh, at least three adult trials looking at moderate brain injuries in different parts of the country. Um, in terms of like, advanced equipment, <laughs> pricothyroidotomy, very rare nowadays to have to do a crike because the advanced airway equipment, glide scopes, other things, fiber optics have become so good. And most uh, EDs are well equipped with uh, enough advanced airway equipment that crikes are probably going to be done emergently in a child, boy, I don't know, once every many years now. Um, I don't think we've done one in our ER here in, in a decade at least. All kinds of equipment issues for kids, so infant bags, child bags, adult bags, what kind of bag, uh, where's the bag, you know, does the bag still work, um, you know, et cetera. Lots of equipment issues with pediatric injury care, as with all pediatric emergency care. Some color-coded system of some sort, there's weight-based ones that work out well, but the idea is during your crisis moment, when you're intubating a child in your emergency department or some other crisis going on with this child in your ED, the last thing you want to do is try and remember a formula. You either need a pocket brain or you need something organized in such a way that without thinking, you can turn and have the appropriate piece of equipment in your hand for that child that's in front of you. <clears throat> On to breathing. Deficits in breathing can be subtle. They can be this gradual accumulation of CO2 in a patient who seemed to be breathing okay. And this is not uncommon in brain injured patients, especially for you know, EMS squads who aren't quite as comfortable with the care of kids. Um, breath sounds are cell air like adults. Crepitus on the chest is in pneumothorax until determined otherwise. Don't let that child wander around unless you've determined that that is a, uh, not a pneumothorax that needs to be addressed. Tracheal position does shift in a child much more than an adult. And the set probe not picking up is a key sign of, of trouble in a kid. If no breath sounds on one side, crepitus on the chest, child is hemodynamically compromised, no x-ray done before needling. <clears throat> and a quick story, because uh, I'm already carrying on too long. So this is a uh, young lady who uh, her mom, is a, she was an unrestrained kid in a minivan. Mom missed a turn on our uh, mass bike, one of our highways here, and uh, hit a guardrail. A uh, child had his portable x-ray taken in the emergency department. There was, you can see her endotracheal tube, was whisked up to the CT scanner. And while she's laying on the gantry, uh, an old system problem for us. This x-ray was developed up two floors away, and I got this phone report that the child was uh, had a pneumothorax on the right side. You can sort of see this pneumo. So while she's laying on a CT gantry, I put a chest tube in her side and to evacuate the pneumo. And as, as I did, once I did that, she coded. And the reason why she coded was because she actually had a bilateral tension pneumothoraces. And when I relieved the pressure on her right side, her heart and her metastinum moved over to that right side and it kinked off the superior vena cava and kinked off the inferior vena cava and decreased the venous return to her heart. <clears throat> well, luckily we had a second chest tube and I remarkably expeditiously put a chest tube in her other side and, and got her back. And so um, this is a great teaching point to me that she had bilateral pneumos, was oxygenating, ventilating fine. She got in trouble from the tension only when her mediastinum was able to move because that's how you get in trouble from a tension pneumo. It's not from the not breathing, it's from the shift in the mediastinum. Circulation in a child, a lot of kids are tachycardic, but they tend to get tachycardic before adults. Check capillary refill for a good measure for their circulation. And in a little baby, external blood loss could be meaningful. 
Importantly, don't wait for a child to get hypotensive before you realize that they're in trouble. Um, they have to lose about 40% of their blood volume uh, before they'll reliably become hypotensive. Tachycardia with low normal blood pressure is much, much more common. Mentation is the first thing to go. A six-month-old baby ought to be looking in the eye, probably pretty frightened, looking around the room, acting appropriate. If they're not, there's something going on. They might have gotten in meds, maybe they're hypothermic, maybe they're in shock, maybe they have a head injury, there's something. But if they're not mentating, you've got to worry that it could be shock. And again, this shock index can be very handy. Um, we're still working on the proper age adjustment, uh, for, especially for the littlest kids. And uh, Dennis's uh, work is, is really good, but there's other, we need more patients and we need a little bit you know, better clarification of the exact ranges for kids before we should worry, before we're able to um, just really nail that down. IV access, bigger day. Diameter, shorter length is what you want. Peripheral veins, uh, I.O. if they're in shock. Just it used to be try, try, try for a peripheral and then go I.O. Now if they're in shock, just go I.O. Really nice kits available of different manufacturers. Central lines are our last choice. I've done probably 1,000, 2,000 central lines in kids. I've probably more than 2,000. And uh, I don't do them down in the ER. Um, if it's really hitting the fan, I do a cut down to the cephalic vein. And uh, the reason for that is slides some IV tubing up. Here's a flow rate from just gravity with a 24 gauge IV. If I just nick the vein and slide up the, cut off the connector and slide some IV tubing into the vein, um, just by gravity, it's a 14 times the flow rate of a 24, 22 of these other IVs. Amazing flow. You can hook it to your level one. You'll get your, you know, put in a liter per minute of uh, whatever you want. I mean, it's a, a great IV, and you're not worrying about, you know, pneumothorax or giving them a DVT from poking their femoral vein. So let's talk about labs. What labs correlate with injury? Uh, so we looked at this study with Andrew Caparo from our ER. 500 trauma uh, activations in a row, and we looked at this. Do, what labs correlate with an injury? And which ones uh, show some metabolic concern you need to fix? How quickly do they come back? Are they back time, quickly enough to do something about it, or they come back later? And then which ones tell you, like, you need a CT or not? So which ones are actually helpful for taking care of the patient versus just throwing out some panel of stuff? And what we found was um, the valuable ones a crit. So if your crit's less than 30, there's a real sign you're in trouble. I would hope that we would know from some other way, but again, less than 30, there's a problem here. If you have blood in your urine, though we don't know the limit for blood in your urine, but if you have some meaningful amount, whether it's a 3 plus or more than 50 or something, wherever that line is for hematuria that triggers more imaging, um, so are you really looking for blood? Uh, we hold a chemistry tube. We just draw it and hold it so we don't have to poke the kid again if we want something later. We only do a type and screen for a highest level trauma activation. So if you look at your trauma kids and see who actually got blood within the first day or two days before your type and screen expired uh, or your type and cross, who actually got that? And you can hone down, that's what we did, and we can hone down the patients who got a type and screen, which, by the way, costs $450 for us. That's the cost, not the charge. I'm sure it's like you know a million dollars charge. But the, uh, just to do that study. And we only get coags and lights for our brain injured patients. We want to drive up their sodiums and they worry about coagulopathy and fixing it before they put a monitor in. Uh, otherwise, those are really not very helpful for children, maybe for adults, but not for kids. So what films do we get? So the philosophy of those HLS, I need a neck, chest, pelvis films, you're looking for the shock. Is it neurogenic because their neck's in two pieces and their cervical cord is injured? Is it a tamponade or hemoneurothorax or is it a pelvis, this popped open truncated cone of the pelvis and they're pouring blood into these large pelvic veins and filling the pelvis full, pelvis full of a blood line? That's why you get those films in the ER just like that. They're oftentimes pretty lousy quality films, but we're looking for the shock. And um, the, the idea with that is that if the child's in shock, sure, get the shock films. If they're not in shock, you're wasting your time and money and the radiation exposure by getting those films. We only get C-spine films by algorithm, and our algorithm doesn't project very well, but if, if there are a lot of algorithms. The Canadians have come up with a really nice one. Uh, P. Karn is working on one. Um, we get a chest film for mechanism. Hit in the chest, 40% of kids with meaningful chest injuries don't have a mark on their chest. Uh, we only get a pelvic film if you're suspicious of a pelvic injury and you're not going to scan their belly for some odd reason, they'll get a plain film. Or if this is too unstable to get a CT, which for us, um, our CT is uh, across the hall. It's probably 25 feet, if that far, from our resuscitation room. And we will sometimes resuscitate patients on the gantry in the CT just because it's in the ED, um, especially if they have a bad head. Um, and they haven't had a CT of their head. So um, if they're un too unstable to, you know, do other things too, you can get a plain film to see if they've got that popped open pelvis. I need to mention the PAN scan to, um, to tell you that it's a really bad thing to do to a child. Head, neck, chest, belly, pelvis. 
And this is done routinely on children, partly because it's done routinely on adults, and so adult-oriented providers, it's quick, easy, get great images. But I call it FOC, uh, not FOS, but FOC, fear of child. People are afraid they're going to miss something. They're, this kid's there. I don't really, there's, I'm petrified because there's this kid there. I don't take care of a lot of kids. Just scan them. You know, just don't mess around. Just scan the kid. And so we don't miss anything on that might harm this child. Um, and I've seen five-week-old kids who, you know, tumble down some steps, get a pan scan. Um, well, here's the problem. So here's some study from the Journal of Trauma. This is a, a mixed trauma center. And patients under 20 years of age, they had their average radiation dose was this 24.65. Let's just make it 25, just for easy saying. It's millisieverts. It's the dose the organs absorb. Well, if you look at this one down here is the meaningful one. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, the estimated lifetime attributable risk of death from cancer. So this is the chance, the added chance this person is going to die because of the cancer, the radiation exposure. If you look at a five-year-old, this black box here is a belly CT in a five-year-old. This is a 0.09% chance <clears throat> that that child is going to die from cancer. For every child who dies, four kids get cancer, one kid dies. And so this kid has a 0.09% chance just from this one belly CT. And that's about 6 to 10 millisieverts. And that study showed their average patient got like 24 millisieverts when they look back at the imaging studies they've done. 0 0.09 sounds like a really low number, but it's 1 out of 1,100. So you're saying of these kids getting bellies, 5-year-olds getting belly CTs, 1 out of 1,100 of them are going to die because of that radiation. And let's say that's like way off. Let's say that's just, you know, off by a factor of 4. Well, this would be one out of 1,100 are going to get cancer, and, and you know, one out of 4,000 are going to die. That's still not a great number uh, for, as for a study that may or may not need to be done. And here's another study with a bunch of, uh, this is girls and boys, and this is the risk of thyroid cancer per 100,000. So this also sounds like, wow, 100,000 is like a lot of people. And if you draw this line at 100, this is the, from the radiation that's delivered to do a CT of the cervical spine. And if you look at 100, so all of these kids here, are higher than 100. For some reason, I don't understand, girls are more cancer radiation susceptible than boys. So this is up to around, say, 8 years of age. I don't know, some of the kids up here. But somewhere around in, say, 6 to 10 years of age, girls younger than that have about a 100 out of 100,000, otherwise known as a 1 out of 1,000 chance of getting thyroid cancer because they got a CT just of their cervical spine. Boys is a little bit lower, but girls is a big deal. So if you're going to be doing a CT of the neck in a two, three, four-year-old, you could be given, this is 200 here, one out of 500 of those kids cancer because of that CT of their neck. Uh, again, Radiologic Society of North America, 2010. Um, there's a lot of other literature, and this one is actually, because uh, a lot of those other data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and people say they're not valid data. Well, this is from the British Medical Journal from Lancet, two studies where they followed up like you can in England, on patients who had uh, something done years before and they had their national medical number that's followed them for life, a 24% increase in cancer and, and within 10 years, which is way earlier than we thought it was going to happen. And remember this, 24 millisieverts? Well, these patients only got four and a half. So with a four and a half dose, they identified a 24% increase in cancer in those patients uh, within 10 years of getting that kind of a, those children that kind of a dose. And again, increased risk too in the Lancet study. Well, if this one point, this is 140-something patients from our place who had a CT scan of their belly done before they got to us. And they were, per national standards, they were supposed to get this amount of radiation, 1.0. Half of the patients who got sent to us with a belly CT done before arrival at our shop got uh, more than the dose of radiation that they were supposed to have received, doubling or tripling their dose, their chance for cancer later on. Because many of these machines are not turned down for children. They just they run through at adult settings. All of these studies, even these lowest, lowest radiation studies, we could read the films fine. So here's what we know so far. So um, let's talk about the C-spine stuff, and uh, I just want to clear this up, and I'm going to talk really fast because I probably spent too much time talking about Kanye West. So how do we clear a C-spine? There's a, f a couple of philosophical things that change everything. Number one, clearing a C-spine is not an emergency. You do not have to do it right there in front of you unless the child has a deteriorating neurologic science. Like if they're a weakening leg or they're losing motor skills or they're numb arm or something, that's an emergency. That's a hurry. If they're, uh, we don't use steroids. There are very few places left that use steroids in children. Children were not included in any of the NASIS trials. And, uh, and the data for harm related to steroid administration 
in spinal cord injury in children at least is greater than the data for benefit. So the National Pediatric Neurosurgical Association has come out with a statement um, basically pretty much saying don't use steroids. Um, and uh, it's an ASP, an ASP uh, the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery's policy statements. Um, the, so we don't use steroids, whoops, so there's no time clock ticking for us. And if they have stable findings, it's not a hurry. It is a clinical event. Number two, philosophy. It's a clinical event, not a radiographic event. You cannot clear a child's cervical spine through the use of CT scan. You can get beautiful images of the bone, beautiful images, 3D images of the bone. You cannot see the ligaments. On a, on a CT, so it's not a radiographic event. So getting better radiographs, more detailed radiation dosing radiographs is not going to clear the neck. It's got to be done clinically. So what we do is we examine them. If we can't clear them initially, we put the collar back on and re-examine them. And, um, and if need be, we re-examine them in the morning and see how they look then. A little distraction is okay. If a child has a broken something, but the dust has settled down, they realize you know they're not going to die. The parents have realized they're not going to die. We come back later on if they can talk with them about their teacher and the sport they like and their video game that all the boys play video games now. That uh, that they're um, and we can discuss the weapon they choose to use in their video game. They're not so distracted that if I push on their broken bone, they're gonna they're not going to tell me. Uh, and it, so the expression I like to use is no one died from being in a collar. I'm not sure it's entirely true, but this is about the worst you can get. This, we left this kid too long in a transport collar before flipping out to one of our in-house collars, and we changed brands, and we had some problem initially with fitting the brand right. He had a little bit of a hair rub off in the back of his head from the back of his collar. That's about what you get. Maybe some breakdown on the shoulders if you're being, you know, inadequately padding. And those are annoyances, <clears throat> but it's very different than the chance for cancer. So what do we do? If you're, if you're in shock, you get a lateral film to make sure your neck's not into pieces. Uh, clearance algorithm. We've got one. A lot of places have one. Happy to share ours if anybody wants, uh, wants it. We do not do screening neck CT scans at our institution. If someone, somehow one happens to make its way through our system, they get a, a uh, discussion with the trauma director of our hospital to see what was so different about this child that they needed it. About 60% of kids get cleared with no films. Well, what does that result in? So here's our hospital. 54,000 kids over five years in our ER, 106 neck CTs, 0.2% of our patients, around 24% of them were positive. Here's the other children's hospitals in our state, and here's the general hospitals in our state. So you can see our positive rate is, is high. I'm actually a little bummed it's not higher because our plan is to only get CT to clarify abnormalities on plain film. Nerdy hospital helmet, much nerdier bike helmet. Only around 15% of kids, even these days, wear a bike helmet when they're riding their bike because um, the parents just don't bother to tell them. So let's talk a little bit about some other stuff. So level of consciousness. Is the patient alert, responds to verbal stimuli, responds to painful stimuli, unresponsive? That ballpark, really kind of silly mnemonic AVPU, is probably enough. The reason for that is if pre-hospital in New York State, you're a unresponsive secondary brain injury and you're a child, you're probably not going to survive. The point I'm trying to make is um, with just assessing this right up front, Aggressive brain injury management now, not on the other side of the CT, not up in the unit, not once after neurosurge arrives. You can consult with your neurosurgeon about mannitol versus hypertonic. The idea is that if a patient comes in and they've got a brain injury and it's a real brain injury, you take care of it now. Every moment that goes by, their neurons are suffering. So as quickly as you can hop on that, it's a better thing for the patient. They don't have to be in a different geographic location for that care to begin. It's the number one killer of kids. Hypothermia trial, this sadly was stopped. Um, the trial going on in Pittsburgh, taking out the Phoenix, uh, was stopped because they weren't going to be able to reach the study endpoints. We know some things, though. Hypotension is very harmful. Uh, we know that uh, it, it's oftentimes from the brain injury, but whatever you can do to, to uh, we don't know the etiology of this hypotension. Some of it is probably centrally mediated, uh, but, it's, uh, but we know it's harmful for the perfusions of the brain. Uh, we use saline instead of ringers. They want to drive up their sodiums. Uh, there's no proven therapy for brain injuries yet. I have proven therapy for all kinds of different rare conditions, but for the number one killer kids, we don't have any proven therapy. And one thing that does often go by, kid comes in with a broken something and a concussion. The concussions traditionally we've been sort of neglecting. Well, we're, we're not neglecting them anymore. So our philosophy of brain injury resuscitation, maximize oxygen delivery to brain cells. Normal temperature, we want to get normal blood flow to the brain, even if that means adding on pressors. Uh, we want a normal blood pressure and a good hematocrit, a good sort of tough to define, but it can't be too low. 
Uh, we need to want to rest their brain cells, so we're going to maximize their sedation within uh, tolerance for their blood pressure. We don't use any dextrose because in our IV fluids, we just run saline. Where is the saline? Uh, it must be on the previous slide. We just run saline, no D5 anything, because it drives up the glucose, which is up anyway because of the stress from the trauma, and increases the metabolic rate of their neurons. I like hypertonic, a little man crush on that compared to mannitol because they run into some problems in hypovolemic is with mannitol. Uh, boluses of hypertonic norm with normal saline run in the background. Um, there's a really nice study from uh, Nate Cooperman and PCARM folks on who doesn't need a brain CT. 42,000 kids, 25 ERs over a couple of years, <clears throat> and you can't, won't be able to tell us out in great detail what's in the PDF. Kids under two and kids over two, if you walk down these, they don't have those things, and they don't have those things, they don't need a CT. If they don't have those things and they do have these, they can be observed. Well, if you look at the kids who need, they felt needed a CT, it's only 14% of kids, whether it's the older kids or the under two kids. And you can really take half of the kids right off the top, don't have any of these, and another 14%, if you're willing, well, these guys get scammed. But these guys, if you're willing to observe them, you can get another third of the kids and avoid a CT scan with a very low rate for a meaningful brain injury. I'm showing this graph. This is from 44 children's hospitals in the U.S. over a 10-year period. Just to show the Splenectomy rate in children's hospitals is around 2%. The splenorphia rate is around 0.7%. So around 2.6% of kids get an operation, which means about 97.4% don't, even, and the rate has gone down over the years of, of splenic injuries has gone down. But the idea is that children's, kids will come into these hospitals that do need a splenectomy. It does happen. But if your hospital is hitting like 5, 10, 15% splenectomy rate, you need to look at how you're, they're managing those children. Is there a different way to manage it where they maybe wouldn't need a splenectomy? Um, this is the unapproved use. Let me warn you, this is unapproved use is about to come. Okay, this is the unapproved use of an investigative agent. Uh, this is some stuff called Optizon. It's a uh, perf it's, uh, albumin with these little perfluorocarbon bubbles. This is a picture-in-picture -picture ultrasound. This is an ultrasound of a, of a young man's spleen. And you can kind of see here, there's like a little hint of an injury, and this is the same, uh, the same time with, this is a, a contrast enhanced, so they spin the ultrasound so you can see it and not see it. And you can see this divot in the spleen, a grade two spleen injury seen very easily with Optizon, where it's kind of really hard to tell with a regular ultrasound. And the hope was in the next five years or so that we'll be able to do this contrast enhanced ultrasound stuff and not need to do a CT. We're finishing a pilot study now. So the other, I've got pretty much my last point I really don't want to miss, and this is it, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I used to not believe the post-traumatic stress disorder happened in children, but um, uh, after a couple really sad cases of kids getting it, realized that it does and that it's actually a really big deal. Um, this is some nice data from uh, CHOP that um, in kids and in parents, um, within 30 days after the injury, if they've got post-traumatic stress disorder, it's actually got a different name. It's called acute stress disorder. And all the ASD or acute stress disorder is, it's post-traumatic stress disorder for less than a month. So within the first month, one-fourth or one-fifth of kids and one-third of parents get it. And after a month, about one-sixth of each of these groups still have PTSD. And oftentimes this is worse than the physical injury. And it doesn't correlate with the degree of injury. It can be a broken leg, broken arm, something else. It does correlate with parental stress. So it correlates directly with parental stress, not with the degree of injury. And interestingly, the kids who get knocked out seem to have a lower rate of PTSD than the kids who don't. And it makes me wonder about maybe the things, the boarded, collared, finger in every orifice, tubes, IVs, all the stuff that we do to these kids might be worsening their, their, um, their trauma, their mental trauma from these. I think a lot of these are very preventable, and this is one of the reasons we have the parent in the room. The child calms the parent down, and the parent calms the child down, and hopefully it correlates with less parental stress and hopefully less PTSD. Hopefully. Um, and this just shows that even in kids with this blue line, is kids with minor injuries compared to kids with no injury, their physical functioning and is uh, still decreased after their injury compared to kids, uh, normal kids. We don't fully understand why these general health markers in, in the child health questionnaire are lower for even kids with mild injuries afterward. But given the incidence of PTSD and other issues like that after injury, uh, it could be that. So in conclusions, uh, life is actually better. Trauma rates are way down across the country, especially up here in True Blue Liberal, Tree Hugger, Massachusetts. But trauma remains the number one cause of death for kids. 
Um, the resuscitation of a child, these crisis resource management principles are key. They have helped us tremendously. And we now get kudos on uh, how quiet and organized and calm our resuscitations are. Uh, and it's a lot nicer for me rather than going down into some chaotic mess. It's uh, sort of enjoyable to be able to think about what's wrong with the kid rather than trying to, you know, kick people out of the room. Um, CT gives beautiful 3D pictures but great harm. And don't forget those long-term outcomes. And always think about PTSD when you're evaluating a kid. There are some simple things to do, like talk to them like they're a kid, make sure that you, want, you acknowledge that, you know, their concerns. Uh, there's any parents' concerns, so hopefully decrease that. And plug before this my last slide. So the PD Trauma Society, a doctor equals a nurse equals EMS equals policy providers. Um, the, um, it really goes across training. Um, our second president of the Trauma Society was uh, a nurse, and I would love to have uh, um, you know, more nurses be president. And surgeons are kind of aggressive people, and so we try to keep them at bay. But we do education research and advocacy for, the, for injured children at this website, pediatrictraumasociety.org. Third annual meeting is in November in Nashville. And then finally, if anybody wants any like policies, procedures, anything like that, this is my email address. It's david.mooney at children's.harvard.edu. Um, and um, I'm going to be, I don't have anything until about 2 o'clock, and I don't know if I'm able to stay on, the, on this line or not, but uh, I'm just planning to hang out for a little bit. And then, um, and, and again, if you need anything at all, please send me an email. Thank you very much, Dr. Mooney. Um, currently, we do not have any questions in the question queue. And as a reminder, if you have questions, there's a question queue on the toolbox on the side. You can go ahead and type those in. So, so looks like we're getting some. Not even about Kanye West running for president? <laughs> Um, we had a question about the slides. Um, the slideshow is attached to the handout section as a PDF, so you can grab those whenever. Um, still no actual questions, no Kanye West questions. Um, so as a reminder, if you are attending the session live, you will receive an email in about one hour with directions to complete the evaluation, and your CE certificate will be emailed approximately 7 to 14 days after today's event. If you're viewing this session as an on-demand CE, you'll be able to download your certificate after completing the quiz and the evaluation. Okay, and I do have a question for you, Dr. Mooney. Sure. How effective is the trauma nurse leader program at your hospital? We well, you know we. I would say we don't know. Um, we were just talking about that again this morning. So we just had a mock trauma this morning at our at our place. Um, our attendings are required to uh, pass a uh, trauma simulation. Um, we have a lot of attendings. We run it every month, so it's about every couple of years. They have to, uh, the attendings have to pass. And, um, and there are occasions when one hasn't passed. And we've talked about, um, and we filmed those. And uh, we were just chatting with our simulation people about doing a study looking at uh, our mock traumas with and without a trauma nurse leader to see if we can come up with some hard numbers for the uh, for things like time to intubation, flow of the room, you know, that sort of stuff, to see if uh, we can measure a difference. Um, I mean, I know it's a lot nicer for me when one of them's down there because they, they take charge. Uh, their role is, um, so we have the, the ED attending oftentimes is the one who kind of runs the event. The surgeon gives sort of either good or bad advice to the ED attending. And the nurse, uh, trauma nurse leader is really keeps us from touching the patient, basically, is what, <laughs> what they do. Um, they keep us in line, which is probably more valuable than our direct behavior. But, but so I, I guess uh, the short answer is we don't know yet, and we're working on getting hard data to show that it, is, it has made a difference for the patients. Thank you, and we're starting to receive more questions, and so I'll get to the next one. We are starting a TNL program at my children's hospital. What are your requirements? What additional training? Um, I guess what I would say is I. Um, I would probably best leave that to Maria McMahon. Um, if if uh, anyone that wants our require our TNL requirements in our curriculum, um, if you can send me an email at that email address, and uh, let me make sure that's bigger. Okay, at that David Mooney at Children's at Harvard Edu, uh, I can send you uh, send you have Maria send you because I don't have it in front of me the requirements for what exactly we put them through. Thank you. Do you use TEG with your PEDS trauma patients? We don't. So TEG is a, is a thromboelastograph, and we don't. And, um, you know, we believe we're God's gift to children's hospitals, but uh, we're behind in that. And um, 
it's unusual for us to have a patient with a coagulopathy after injury, um, and uh, but we're not using TAG currently. We're just using PTPTT still, um, and um, I we may, um, but it's um, it'll probably be pretty infrequent because we're, we're just our the way our business is here where we're located um, with our lack of uh, you know a lot of gunshots and stuff. Um, not as much use for it here as in some places with a bit more violence than we have. Thank you. And I had another question about the slides. And if you look at the handout section on the right-hand side of the little GoToWebinar toolbar, you'll see a handout section, and you can download the PDF of the slideshow there. Um, Dr. Mooney, the next question. How often do you attend a mock trauma? Um, do I attend? Well, I attended one uh, a couple hours ago, actually. So we, we do 12 a year, and um, there are probably 10 a year. We, I think we take July and August off. Um, and um, I probably teach half of them. Um, so I probably do about five mock traumas a year. Do you video your trauma codes? We don't. We ran into the usual problem that the lawyers were concerned, and you know they acted very lawyerly, and um, were not swayed by the by other people's lawyers telling them that it was actually a plus to video. But one other challenge that that we have, we're we're a pretty tightly staffed program, and um, video review of trauma resuscitations I think is extremely valuable if you have the people to do it. Uh, if you don't have the personnel that can commit to um, and some people have told me it's two to four hours of time per video uh, to truly review it. And um, that would be hard for us to pull off right now. Thank you. Are you familiar with the Hanavi system? If yes, is this system more nurse friendly and safe than the Braslo tape commonly used in the pediatric population? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know how something could be nurse friendly or not, but. So, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, thank you. The next question, do you use a specific massive transfusion protocol for injured children? And if so, are you willing to share this? I'm happy to share it. Um, and, um, you know, I travel around a lot of trauma centers, and uh, pediatric trauma centers are required to have a, a massive transfusion protocol for children. Uh, most of them are just weight-based. Ours is similar. And, um, sure, happy to share it. Uh, to me, one of the key components of it is um, the inclusion of the, of the um, whether it's transfusion medicine or lab person, but somebody who basically lives with the lab people and they speak the same language and can sort of just send things down to you rather than have either the surgeon or anesthesiologist or someone else, the emergency medicine person, deciding what comes next for products. That, that's very helpful, but happy to send it to us. So send me an email to that email address. And I'll, and I'll make sure you get it. Great. Thank you. And it looks like we are out of questions. Um, thank you again, Dr. Mooney, for presenting. And thank you for attending. And everybody have a great rest of your day. Right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks for being on.